Empower Than Power Women podcast for your career and your life, no matter what business you're in. Hello. Well, thank goodness. Finally, summer is upon us. So get your caftan on, grab a nice lolly and get ready for episode 26 of the Northern Power Women podcast. Always make time for your passion. I'm Sam Walker, and this month we are very proud to be sponsored by multi-award winning recruitment agency, Searchability. Ever considered a career in recruitment? One of the most innovative tech recruitment agencies in the UK, Searchability, are always interested in hearing from new talent across the North. Visit searchability.co.uk to learn more about Searchability Life and joining their award-winning team. Our panel recording this month took place in Chester at the fabulous Storyhouse Live venue, where we talked about the challenges of work and home life over the summer, why there is still such a dearth of women CEOs, and whether flexible working really will become the norm. Having to not worry about how you're going to pick your children up or fit in time with your family, for instance, when you're stressing about that at work, you're not being productive at all, and there is such a high rate of burnout and stress at the moment that if we can give or take an hour in the in the day or even spread your hours put it into four days to cater I think that's just massive and I think the turn will be that it'll just become standard. In the big interview you'll hear from Meg Bowyer a senior recruitment consultant for searchability Meg is also the captain of League One Stoke City Women's Football Club. She talked about the huge challenge of balancing her work and her passion and also how she deals with naysayers. I don't bite very often. <laughs> I don't bite as much as I used to. I just have to ignore it because to me, they've got a lack of understanding. Mm. They don't understand women's football. They don't understand the game. They don't understand the women that play football. So I wouldn't want to give them the limelight that they're wanting for something that they don't understand. And in Ask the Hive, you keep applying for jobs, but never hear anything back. What do you do? Go and look at their LinkedIn, see if they've got a company Facebook page, see if you can find out their hobbies, their interests, what they're like as a person. But first, let's catch up with all the latest news from Northern Power Women HQ from our very own founder, Simone Roche. Well, we most definitely packed an awful lot in before the kids broke up for summer. We really enjoyed recording this episode in Chester, sponsored by Searchability. It was an extremely lively panel and audience and loved hearing from them. So Laura Koppel from Searchability, Christos Gostis from Unilever and Emma Hutt from Storyhouse, who also hosted us in their great venue. The person with purpose interview this month is Meg Boire, who is absolutely brilliant story and I'm sure you'll enjoy hearing her career journey. This month was also great to be part of the Women's Business Council 100 Ways to Work Flexibly launch and we look forward to working with them to spread the real life best practice examples of flexible working. We attended the launch of the Inclusive Companies event with Paul Cisse and we're delighted to celebrate some of our Northern Power Women Achievements at the We Are The City Rising Star events. Big congratulations to the Karoo sisters and to Vimra Apadu on their success. We were at the Welcome event for GCHQ into Manchester and look forward to working with them in the future. Really thrilled to be a mentor for the Tech Up Women programme, which has been set up by our previous person with purpose, Dr Sue Black. I really look forward to the residential event at Edge Hill University in September. July saw us hit the trains, the roads and many, many steps, including the, our closing event for our first Michael Page mentoring cohort. We had the third in a series of our NatWest role model series over in Newcastle. I oh, loved attending the graduation event at Bradford University, met so many amazing people, and we also recorded next month's pod. Plus, I was made up to go and watch the Roses in the Netball World Cup with Rise Liverpool, who will be working again with them later this year. So, that's us for summer. <laughs> we'll see you next month in Bradford. And if there's anything that you want to share with us, leave a review, tell us who you'd like to hear from, then get in touch. Podcast at Northern Power Women. Have a fantastic summer. Thank you so much to the brilliant Simone, who even by her own standards has had one heck of a month. Now, on each episode, of course, we get together somewhere in the north to chat, to network and to discuss some of the hottest topics around. And this time we were in the beautiful city of Chester. Today we are at the fabulous Storyhouse Live venue here in Chester, sponsored by Searchability. You won't believe the audience, they're absolutely stellar. Welcome, welcome to Chester. Yay! 
We're delighted to be here today. We have a fantastic panel and three great questions as ever. Uh, the first of our panelists today is Laura Koppel, who is digital recruiter at Searchability, which specializes in software testing. She is all about promoting women in tech. Christos Gostis, now I knew I'd get this wrong. I knew I should have checked, did I do well? Thank you. <laughs> He's a business strategist with 15 years in the corporate global supply chain roles, leading a multifunctional and cultural diverse teams. And finally, we have Emma Hutt, who is the HR manager at the wonderful Story House. Uh, she joined the Chester Performs team in 2015 and was part of the build and opening of Chester's multi award winning theater library cinema, arts hub and community centre and looks after 125 employees and 115 volunteers. Welcome to our great panellists. Yeah. Now Emma, just the first question I have to ask, were you here when Megan and the Queen came? It, yes, I was. Um, it was an unusual day at work. <laughs> it was fun and we came together as a team. It was, it was amazing. Did you get a selfie? I didn't get a selfie. I got a couple of feet away from her, but I wasn't allowed any closer. Darn it, darn it. We love NPW selfies here today. Oh, welcome. Thank you. We are going to start. We've got three great questions as ever for our panellists. Please do join in the conversation at North Power Women, hashtag NPW podcast. So summer, uh, to be honest, you wouldn't think it was summer with the, the biblical rain we've just come in through today, but summer can be a stressful time at home and at work. Childcare can be tricky as it's key annual leave period in the workplace. But how can we encourage each other to be present both at home and at work, but not burn ourselves out? Laura. Oh, hello. <laughs> um, so my first point is it might sound a little bit corny, but don't feel guilty about taking the time off because we are so focused constantly on work. I, I can't speak on the children point of view because I haven't got any kids, but um, trying to balance family, hobbies, all that type of stuff. But having little breaks throughout the day, like making sure to get away from your desk at lunchtime, really easy things to do, but we get so stuck from our nine to fives of just being glued there and past that as well. So yeah, just little bits and turn the phone off. Turn the phone off at night and engage with your family. Turn the phone <laughs> off. Oh God, I need to try that. I'm not great at that, I have to ask. Christos. Thank you very much, Simone. I think I just want to build on what Laura was saying. I think there, there are, I think there's some values in, well, I guess, approaching it from three perspectives. Personal perspective, I think as Laura explained, there has to be, you have to be a little bit self-centered in this approach. You have to look after your priorities. The second is to engage with your partner. Uh, I think there's looking at the wider uh, community and start looking at what the priorities of you and your partner are and what the opportunities you can do com in combination together. Be very clear on what you want and be very clear to understand what the other person wants as well. And then take that exact element and go to your organization. And then from the organization perspective, have a look and understand again, what can they do in order to meet your requirements? I think it, it, you have to be very clear on what you want you have to be very clear what would be beneficial for you and your partner. And you have to be very clear to your boss or to your to your organization what would make a change for your life. But you have to be very clear what you intend to achieve out of it. Um, and don't be shy. Don't be shy to ask. Negotiate, make a plan, and don't be shy. Top tips, I think, there from Christos. Thank you. Emma? I would absolutely agree with the previous two answers. I think that actually a, a lot of workplaces now do try to build a culture where we don't expect people to be working 24 7 i think we were talking about this before that we think it's starting to shift back to you know being able to switch off and have time and have family time and get that balance and that all comes into you know the well-being argument and how we should be looking after ourselves and decrease in stress and um absenteeism um i think as well it's as well as it being about you personally and about the employer, I think there's there's ways that other organisations can can work. We, I was talking to some of my colleagues who are parents because I'm not a parent yet. Nearly though. Nearly. <laughs> so my answer might be entirely different in 12 months. <laughs> um, but we were talking about um, how holiday clubs and things like that aren't aren't always the most flexible with wraparound care. And actually there's ways we can probably work 
as a community to, to work with other organisations to try and improve that for families. And we've talked about agility and flexible working on, on the podcast before. Uh, we also have um, NPW Live, an event we did a, a couple of years ago, which was like a, a series of 19 10 minute talks, which are also available on, on the podcast stream. And one of the talks was about your only young wants. And it was about taking that time with your family because we don't get to go this way again uh, with our family. Anyone in the audience um, who thinks, just a show of hands, who, who've got challenges this summer? Let's have a look. A lowish number. Do you have a plan? Do you have to negotiate in a plan like Christos? Any, any top tips or how you may be looking to tackle it? Just one second, Gabby, coming to you. So I'd say just as an add-on to talking to people and voicing, you know, where you will need support don't be afraid to just directly go to someone that you kind of trust where you work or in your circle and say I really need you to kind of be a bit of a champion for me I'm off work for various different reasons you know just reach out to someone that you trust and make sure that you've got someone there to kind of have your back while you're off work if that's what you're worried about as well the circle of trust and I think that's where that whole the wider networking doesn't it and the wider community and the wider circles really add value whether you you have a family or you you know uh, you're you're expanding your role whatever that may be so just one second Catherine yeah so I um I work for myself and I support other female entrepreneurs that also work for their, themselves and I think you asked about a bit of a plan and I think the tendency when you're an entrepreneur working in your own business is that you will just keep going through the summer and you'll try try and somehow juggle because you are your business Um, and um, the tendency maybe is to just get up a bit earlier or go to bed a lot later and still be there for the kids um, in the day and I think sometimes it's encouraging entrepreneurs either to completely take that break out I know certainly from having built my own business that actually sometimes it's just really good just to stop some of my best ideas have come when I've completely stopped so either stop entirely or treat your business you've got to separate yourself from your business and make sure that you also, as Crystal says, you put in a plan in place and and pull on that support that's around you. I couldn't agree more. I actually do. I personally do negotiate with my husband, Northern Power Man. Um, You know, we we, even when we try and go away, there is a tendency that entrepreneur is just always on, isn't it? Always on culture. So we do. We negotiate and we negotiate about those breaks. And I always try to exceed expectations by being ready early, like a like I'm a teacher's pet. Um, But it's important. Uh, Laura. Yeah, well, we also work in recruitment. So my prime time for speaking to people is of an evening. I was saying before that I've spent many a night at the kitchen table in my pajamas talking to people at 10 o'clock at night. Um, But that is our time. So finding that balance of switching off and then being able to come in the next day, still be fresh and actually talk to the people that are at home as well. It's finding that really tough balance. Christos, you had something. I was just going to add something to to your earlier point, which is, while I think you're running an, your your business independently or running a team, you they look up to you in order to give them guidance and support and um, and help. You cannot give them help if you're not ready to help. And I think it's very important. Uh, it, it's very easy to just say, if I don't work, I don't get paid. The business doesn't grow. A lot of the times, actually, if you step away, the business doesn't get hurt at all. And you have some time to yourself, which is much needed to come back and say, aha, you know, while I was sitting there reading my newspaper in the middle of nowhere, I came up with an idea, which may be the idea I need to go to the next stage of my business. So I think it's wonderful to take that opportunity. It's almost pushing yourself in a way that you know you should not be doing, but it's the best time to do it. Who's not queuing up for Christos to be a coach? Just saying. (laughs) Second question today. Thank you so much and thank you to our audience. Um, A new report from Pipeline shows gender equality is still an issue in business. In FTSE 350 businesses, fewer than 4% have female chief execs and half have no women on their executive committees. Pipeline has called for companies to have 33% target of women on their boards. But what is the best way that we're going to be achieved this? How do we stop the stall or unstall? Emma. So we've actually been through this process and this challenge at Storyhouse. Um, When I started, we had under 20% female representation on our board. We've now got 55% representation, um, female representation on our board. And the 
only reason I think that that happened is because the entire board actually bought into it. And I think you need that buy-in from your exec team, from your trustees, and to make it their agenda, their their biggest priority on the agenda. And we're now champion, championing a young trustee as well. So someone who is 18 years old, she's a female as well, and she's, she's absolutely brilliant. She's come through our Young Leaders Programme and she's now sitting on our board as a, a young trustee. So we're really trying and it's a big focus for us to diversify. I do think probably as a charity and a smaller organisation, we're probably in a better position because people will volunteer it, it's a volunteer role and they will volunteer their time to organizations that match the values of their own to that organization i think it's probably a little more difficult for larger organizations with more traditional hierarchy and structure but i do think it's all about the buy-in from the top that's brilliant i think that's fantastic that for an organization started in 2015 identified a challenge and have solved it. And I think one of the key recommendations from the, the report, the number one recommendation is for chief execs to take responsibility. So that looks as though exactly what you've done. We've talked about culture before on this podcast as well. So thank you, Laura. Yeah, so just obviously I can only talk about like the tech environment and the number of women in tech is just so disproportionately low and how are we going to build these leaders if we don't have them there in the first place so i think a massive massive thing for a lot of businesses is the ownership as emma said but also to retain these people in your culture and give them the platforms for them to be able to grow and a lot more in the tech industry of we've got big groups of like women in tech innovate her over in liverpool that deal with these getting women in STEM education as well, because how are we gonna have future female leaders if we haven't got them to start off with, especially in the tech industry anyway? So it's build the pipeline yeah. and, and access to the role models. Christos. Uh, I must say I'm quite lucky because I work for a woman. So uh, the chief quality officer for Unilever is, is uh, a fantastic lady from Poland. And for me, it's a great insight, as to your earlier point, Emma, that CEOs do take it very seriously. Um, certainly from Unilever's perspective, it's something that's been a very proactive approach for many years now. And we do see s- stronger and stronger presence of women in top roles. But I don't really want to talk about corporates. I want to talk about the other ecosystem around them. While you see a large, uh, sorry, say a sp- relatively small proportion of ladies in corporate environments, you see tremendous amount of ladies running their own businesses. So where the void of s- SMEs is now con- currently being filled in by small businesses, which are run by very effective, very passionate ladies. What then tends to happen, and I would see that in the next five to 10 years, is that those ladies will build their capability, the teams will expand, that more often than not, either the company itself will expand or the company will be bought over and merged with somebody else. And then you'll see that same person in a CEO position. And that's the that's a natural progression, just because we recognize there is a problem does not mean that instantaneously there'll be a solution. It, it, the solution becomes very effective, very structured, but actually you'll see that person having tremendous amount of capability because the journey they have had is phenomenally different to the traditional position. So I th- I'm looking forward to this, uh, to this environment changing tremendously in the next few years. I think that's a really good point to make, Christos, as well. It's looking at the different the system. Any thoughts from the audience about the you know, how we can unstore. We've talked about this, haven't we, for for what feels like eons and eons. And I think if we keep going the way we're going, it's we're decades and decades before we get to that parity. Uh, Joanne. Hi, um, I work for Cheshire West Voluntary Action. Um, we're a charity based in Chester and we've actually got a campaign running at the moment to encourage more women to join trustee boards. I'd love to talk to you more about um, how you've done it, actually, Emma, because what we found is that the majority of well, small charities around here anyway. Um, It's mostly male trustees and mostly over a certain age as well, which is great because they're, you know, they're doing a job, but it'd be great to get some more women on board. So that's one of the things that we're trying to do right now. Thank you. And and how can people get involved or? Um, They can get in touch with me. Um, I can, I can speak to people afterwards. Brilliant. We will put some stuff out after the podcast as well. Jodie, I'm coming your way. Hi there. Um, Yes, I agree with all of those things. So this is an and on top of it. It's probably slightly more controversial in that sense, but I've done the corporate life. I was an executive coach in corporate land. I'm now an entrepreneur, self-employed. 
and I work with women to build assertiveness. So uh, that's what I coach these days. And um, so on top of all those things, I'm working really hard to empower women and build their confidence to put themselves forward more. So I think it's a two sided thing, but I want women to also start to look in the mirror a little bit but have the right support and development around them to really elevate them up there so they feel capable and confident to go and do some of this stuff because I know that's an issue for a lot of women I work with. Do you have one top tip? One top tip. Not putting you on the spot there at all, Jodie. Yeah. Okay, <laughs> so my favourite has got to be say what you want, not what you don't want. That's what I see happen for women a lot. They'll tell you what they don't want rather than be able to go, I would like this to happen. So sometimes it's the people pleaser or approach as opposed yeah. to say, this is what we're trying. Yes, absolutely. There's a lot of tip, top tips, but that would just be one for now. Oh, I can feel a blog coming on. I can feel that coming on. Christos. I love the comment, Jody. To be honest, the one thing that I heard from a coach a few years back was have a presence on the table, which happens to a lot of ladies. They tend to take an automatic step to, to take a seat at the just at the second row or at the back row. It's just natural. I'm not necessarily saying it's done at the back of their mind. Go in the front of the table. Uh, we're delighted at the moment. We're progressing a, um, an arrangement with the BBC. We did an event a few weeks ago as part of the 50-50 representation in the media. And we had 50 of our Northern Power Women community over at Media City uh, going behind the scenes at BBC Breakfast on that fabulous red couch and uh, Radio 5 Live and Wake Up to Money. And I was at, at BBC Broadcasting House the other week and we know that since that event, there have been, I think, 13 of our Northern Power women represented in the media, which out of 50 in a room, I think in a, in a space of two and a half weeks, I think is progress. So it's all part of that kind of stepping forward and, and getting involved in those conversations. So thank you. Thank you very much. Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm lunging a bit further. This is great. We're in the Garrett Theatre here at the Story House. I'm just navigating some steps. Lois. Hello there, my name is Lois. I'm representing young gypsies and travellers across um, like the UK. Um, something that I think is also important is your power as a consumer. So making choices about where you're going to buy things. So for example, with a lot of minority women, like a lot of our businesses aren't purchased into by the mainstream population because of ideas of racism and sexism that are intertwined. And one of the ways that you can kind of overcome these things as a consumer, as a young woman, is making the decision to buy or purchase into businesses that are owned by, for example, minority women and all these other women, all these small businesses to help them grow. And that's something else as well. I think that needs to be recognised. But yeah, cheers. That's it. Thank you. Uh, lots of great discussion today, which we always love. As we say, this is all about starting the conversation on the Northern Power Women podcast. If there is a question that you would like to be discussed or you would like to join the conversation, please do get in touch with us at connect at northernpowerwomen.com. A final question. Where did the time go? Where did the time go? So question number three. A Conservative MP has called for a bill to make flexible working the rule and not the exception. She says that 40 hour weeks no longer reflect the society we have become. Do you agree? And I know we've, we've just talked about this a little bit earlier. Christos, I'm coming to you first. Thank you very much, Simone. I think that uh, we operate in an environment, however we put it, which is hyper segmented. We have very different portfolios for our products with very different consumers, very different requirements. Longer past the traditional, um, I should say from a manufacturer's perspective, the, man the traditionalist approach of actually manufacturing typical products, which will be mass, um, uh, mass uh, received. Uh, now we're going to almost a level of personalization and that tr tr creates tremendous amount of diversity. That means that if we expect a level of flexibility within our operations, we need to have the same level of flexibility within our operating personnel and their requirements. Their personal requirements also have changed quite a lot. Uh, we, again, we've moved away from a traditional eight to five working environment. Technology has enabled that in, in many cases. And we need to come to a position where we allow people to have the flexibility to understand how they manage their own workload without necessarily being a controlling, should we say, what they do, but giving them clear, very clear guidance on what they need to deliver, when do they need to deliver it by, and how should they approach it, but not how many hours or when specifically they need to be doing that. So it becomes more flexible, more agile, and in the end of the day, it gives us a better work-life balance as individuals. Absolutely. Thanks, Christos. Emma? 
Um, yeah, I 100% agree. Um, I would say that I don't necessarily think that the 40 hour week is gone. Um, I think it depends what sector you're in and to how easy that is to do. But I absolutely think in any sector there is that flexibility, uh, flexible working should be the rule and not the exception. I think it is easier in some sectors. For example, our sector, we're open 15 hours a day, seven days a week. There is absolutely room for all of our staff to work flexibly. And we do that with a mixture of contracts and we flex our staff up and down depending on, on the needs of the business as well. What I've actually noticed is the flexible working requests that we receive from full-time staff, they still operate in their mind in a traditional way and they see that they would the requests tend to be more for a reduction in hours rather than a spread. They would rather take that pay cut sometimes than actually spread the hours across. And actually what we're trying to encourage is a culture that actually you can work your hours and you can work them remotely from home. You can work in a coffee shop down the road. Um, you can you can work those hours anywhere. So it is still possible to do, but there still seems to be a mindset within the individual that I think needs changing as well, that they still see this traditional Monday to Friday, nine to five within certain departments. And we need to try and encourage that. I think there's a trust piece as well, isn't it? It's a trust both ways. I think when I first started working remotely, I think it was eight years ago or something like that. And uh, I, I I was scared to go to the loo kind of thing because you think, oh, my green light's going to go off my off my computer and people think I'm I'm skiving. So it's, it's how we get over that as well, isn't it? Yeah, um, we try to encourage a, a culture of trust with our staff. Um, when we employ people, we make it very clear that we're, we're all adults. We all know the demands of our workload and we know when we're the peak times in our jobs are. And we also know as individuals when we're more productive. So I, for example, am not the most productive person in the morning. I am more so in the afternoon. So I will tend to come in a little later and work a little later because it works for me. And I allow our full-time contracted staff to be able to do that as well, to be able to work when they're most productive and it does it does result in more efficient workforce a happier workforce and this is probably down to one of the facts that as an organization you've achieved that better balance and you know greater uh, culture within your organization over the four years that you've been about laura oh i absolutely love this topic flexible <laughs> working is my favorite so i speak to hundreds of people every week about job requirements what they're looking for their culture everything and flexibility is massive and I think people are turning away from certain opportunities because there isn't the flexibility especially in tech I can work from my phone my laptop anywhere whenever it's not an issue why could I not be trusted to do it from the coffee shop for instance or from down the road so it's having that trust and I think when employees feel like they have they're trusted they work better they'll want to work for you and having to not worry about how you're going to pick your children up or fit in time with your family for instance you, when you're stressing about that at work you're not being productive at all and there is such a high rate of burnout and stress at the moment that if we can give or take an hour in the in the day or even spread your hours put it into four days to cater I think that's just massive and I think the turn will be that it'll just become standard for a lot of people. And I, th I think it's about sharing those examples as well. The Women's Business Council um, in July uh, launched a report around flexibility in the workplace and they're trying to tell the stories of 100 different examples. Uh, and I was at the launch and my question was, that's great it being in book, but how do we really get that story out? Because not everybody gets access or sees that report. You know, we need to be absolutely telling that so that we can sort of lead by example. Who in the room um, considers themselves to be flexible working? Ish. Why ish, Bethan? Um, well, I run a hotel, so it, it never shuts, <laughs> um, <laughs> fortunately. But I've got um, a really good team. We've, we only opened a month ago. So we built that team over the last six months and developed a culture before we opened that, like you say, about trust. And we all trust each other. And I have no problem in my business with somebody coming in, working, leaving at Hubbard's 2, going to pick the kids up and coming back at six o'clock and doing three hours from six or nine if that works for them. So we've built up that together and so I am able to do that. But obviously, like I'm sure a lot of people in the room, there's a lot of responsibility that comes with my role. And so there's flexibility to a degree, 
but it, there's always going to be that work and that hours to do to to balance but i think for me because i'm i have the opportunity of being a female leader and i have you know i have a child and i so i can understand and empathize with my workforce and like you say trust and work together to make the business run essentially there seems to be a lot of great practice going on here in chester do we not think i think it's fantastic um one more i'm coming let me get to these steps Joanne, nice to see you. Hi. Um, I just wonder if we need to start thinking of the language we use. Is the is ours um, a thing anymore? So, for example, I can clean a bathroom really quickly because I hate doing it, and I so uh, literally ten minutes done. But you know that I w I don't put that on my productivity. If I'm writing an article on contemporary dance, uh, I may take a little bit longer. I <laughs> get a because I do enjoy it, and b because there's a lot more to do. So I think sometimes we use the wrong language because if we're talking hour 40 hours what does that mean language any anyone else we've got because we've got a mixture here haven't we? we've got entrepreneurs we've got business owners we've got some fabulous future talent in the room you're very welcome laura going back to that concept of hours as well like a 40 hour week in our industry for instance is unheard of but in someone else's industry it might work or 12 hours might work or whatever it's definitely down to the individual and back to what Emma said about the business as well and catering for someone might be able to just do those 12 hours and get the job done whereas it might completely depends on the environment as well I think. Brilliant and I think I've learned in sort of growing Northern Power Women with our little miniature team and that it's it's understanding how other people want to work whether it's going to the gym whether it's childcare responsibilities I'm, I've learned I'm not bothered you know for someone who thinks they're a control freak I'm actually not bothered when people work it's all about what they do and how you do it. Beth and I'm coming back to you in your hotel. Sorry, just one more thing. We, you say about 40 hour a week. We, we do work on a 40 hour week, but we actually, our contract is 160 hours a month. So someone can work a 25 hour week and then work a 60 hour week and then work, so that it gives them a flexibility over the monthly period to work out if they've got, you know, there's a mad week for school for their children or whatever it is that's going on in their lives. Actually, we calculate it over the, the month rather than the week, which makes it for everybody, not just women, but makes it easier for everybody. But they're still achieving the 40 hours a week. Brilliant, thank you. And I just want to say thank you so much, Chester, for being such a fantastic audience. I want to thank our stellar panel. I can't believe that's it. Where did the time go? Um, but lively as I had expected. Uh, but I would like to ask all of you to join me in thanking our stellar panel today here in the Story House. Thank you to Emma, Christos and Laura and thank you to Searchability for sponsoring this month's episode. We're really delighted to work in partnership with you. Please join in the conversation. Please leave us a review if you fancy it. We'd love it. But thanks again to everyone here in Chester today. See you next time. A big thank you again to our wonderful panel, to Storyhouse Live for hosting us and to Searchability for sponsoring us. And of course, to you, if you came along to take part, we really love to see you. So do keep your eye on Twitter at North Power Women for details of our next recording. And of course, if you'd like to host us or sponsor us, we would love to come. Just get in touch. Podcast at northernpowerwomen.com. Now this month for the big interview, I had a conversation with Meg Boyer, who not only leads a busy work life as a senior recruitment consultant at IT specialist Searchability, but is also captain of the League One professional team, Stoke City Women's Football Club. How on earth do you juggle a challenging job and a challenging passion? I started by asking her how she found her way into recruitment. I started off in account management uh, after I left uni. So I've done an IT degree. So I graduated with an IT degree and then I went into account management, which was something that I did enjoy. I did leave that because of the career progression, but then something kind of drew me to recruitment because in a way it is a little bit like account management, hmm. um, but you've got the sales aspect as well. So in between the account management and the recruitment role, I did do sales roles. So funnily enough, I, I, I did find my way to recruitment through account management and sales, and I've been enjoying it ever since. Really, I think I've been, I've been at Searchability about 18 months now, and I do, I do really enjoy my, my job, even though it's very hectic and very fast-paced. <laughs>
<laughs> well, it's not boring. That's the most important thing, isn't it's it? It's definitely not bo- boring. No. Boring's the worst thing I think always to be. So tell me about this career progression because you said you didn't feel there was career progression in your account management. Can you explain? Yeah, so the, there's... If there's, there wasn't really very many ways to go up when I was working in the account management role because it either goes from account management and then it goes to external sales. Mm-hmm. Um, and they usually take somebody in. So if they've got like a new role uh, for the external sales team, they get somebody from external sales background rather than bringing somebody in from the account management side. So I questioned it and, you know, the opportunity wasn't there for me to, to go into the external sales. So I just thought it's it's time for me to to leave and see what else is, is, is out there so I can progress with, with my career. Was it scary to take that leap? Not really, no. I don't know. I've been there three years, so and I, I loved it. I absolutely loved my job and I loved the people that I work with, but at the same time, I couldn't I couldn't do that job for life. I couldn't with no progression, there's there's mm. no ambition, there's nothing to aim for, and that's not me. So I I kinda as much as I didn't want to leave, I knew I had to. Yeah. Tell me about being in IT as a woman. I mean, it's a conversation we've had on the, the panel of the podcast this week. It's a conversation we've had so many times over the last couple of years on the podcast. Were there many women on your IT course? And, and do you see did you see many women around you when you started out? Uh, no. <laughs> uh, I think I was one of about three women on my IT degree. I'd say it's getting better. It's getting a lot more women are getting into, into IT. Like when I'm looking at CVs at the minute, there is a lot more a lot more women than there used to be. Mm. I think it's something as a whole, though. Even like, obviously, I play football, and there's a lot more women getting into sport. A lot more women getting into football, just like there is on the IT sector. So I don't, I don't think it's just IT and just football. I think it is as a whole, which is which is good to see. Yeah. So, yeah, there wasn't many people on my IT degree, but I can imagine if I went to the same degree now, there would be a lot more women on the degree. So you confident? Because we always talk about you know women in senior roles in IT, and the fact there aren't very many. Are you confident that it will naturally happen as women progress, you know, through their careers? Or do you think actually there needs to be a bit more of an effort? I think it's a bit of both. I think some of it will come naturally. But at the same time, I still think there needs to be a push. I still think there needs to be like the coverage, the media coverage. So I do think it comes from both angles. I don't mm. think one can work without the other, to be honest. But that's that's obviously that's my opinion. Yeah. But I do think it comes from both sides. You now work, obviously, searchability. You know, you, you, your specialist subject is in is in tech and is in IT. Have you noticed companies making an effort to recruit more women? Because it's all very well saying we're an equal opportunities employer, but unless you're actually targeting specific groups, it's hard to attract those people in, isn't it? It is hard to attract them in, yeah. Um, I don't know. It's a difficult question because I, I have had a lot of companies that, that treat you know, male and female quite equal. Mm. Um, I've not had any bad instances, you know, when I have put a female CV forward. They've always had the same uh, the same exposure and the same chances as, you know, the male CVs yeah. that I do put forward. It's just the case of, you know, finding finding the CVs for the women. That's That's been the biggest, the biggest problem. But, you know, I've been here for 18 months now and I can see the change and I can see more women getting involved within the IT sector, so... It's a matter of time plus yeah. that, that extra effort from the, the yeah, employers. Definitely. What do you love, Meg, about what you do? I love the account management side. I love speaking to clients. I love speaking to candidates, um, finding out, you know, the motivations. Um, and then I love being organised. I like being organised in my role and what I do. And because obviously the role's so hectic and the role's so busy, you have to be, you have to stay on top of, of everything that you do. And I do have a busy week. I have long days, long hours, like everybody does. I have hobbies on the side that makes it more difficult, but I wouldn't change any of that because mm. I, I love the fast paced environment, the the fact that you go, go, go all the time. Well, let's talk, um, let's talk about some of these hobbies, as you put them, a bit more than a hobby, you might say. <laughs> Having to be uber organized because you were also, of course, captain of Stoke City Football Club, you 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 head up the women's team. Tell me about that passion. How did that come into your life? Um, so I've got a twin brother um, that I started playing football with, I think when I was about six. So I started playing football with him when I was younger and then I've just not been able to stop playing since. So I joined Stoke when I was 11, been there since, that's 15 years. So I went through the, it's called a centre of excellence. It's like an academy. Yeah. Um, so I went through the academy when I was a kid. And then when I was 16, I went into the first team. I got the captaincy at 18, wow. 19, I think. And then, yeah, like I said, I've, I've had it ever since. I've been there ever since. And it, it, in a way, it helps with work because when you have a stressful day at work, 
some people go home and put the telly on. I like to go to football, go to training and, and get rid of all those really, those like frustrations and release all, all the energy. Do you ever feel that pressure, though, especially as a captain, that you can't be all things to all people? You've already got a really stressful, very, very busy job to then have the responsibility of, of giving your all to football. I mean, that's, do you ever feel you're wearing yourself thin a bit? How do you, how do you create that balance? Yeah, I'm, I'm very tired. <laughs> um, but no, I, I, I enjoy it. Like the, the girls at football are great. They're all, they're all my best friends. It's like a family. Mm. So it's not, it's not difficult. Don't get me wrong. Sometimes it is difficult when I go to football, but it's like, fo- like work, like football. I, I love the people I work with. I love the people I play football with. So it's fun in a way, not all the time, but most of the time it is fun. And then it's, it's how you deal with different challenges and different people and, Football's learned me, like, some people react different ways to different things, so you have to learn how to speak to different people to get the best out of them, mm. which is the same in work. Some, like, one candidate might need speaking to, like, a different candidate, so both have helped me with each other, and I do find them both quite similar. Obviously, one I'm sat at a desk all day, and the other one I am running around, but they are they are similar, and there's a lot of responsibility that comes with the both of them. Just to be really clear, in case people aren't aware of how women's football works for a lot of teams in this country, I mean, you, this isn't a sort of Sunday five-a-side kickabout. This is Stoke City Football Club. It's it's the women's yeah. team. You are in, which league are you in now? So we are in, uh, we're in the National League. So you've yeah. got the Women's Super League, which has got like Arsenal, Man City, Chelsea, yes. people like that in. And then you've got the Championship, which is underneath. Yes. Um, and then we're the one underneath that. So there's the two pro leagues at the top and then we're the one just underneath it. So if we look at the equivalent in men's football in League One, none yeah. of the men playing for League One teams have also got full-time jobs. No. <laughs> How frustrating... <laughs> Do you find this that you are yeah, a professional same. athlete, an athlete, and you know, and I know that there are a lot of women in sport who represent their country in the national teams and still have that full time job, rugby, for example, in a way yeah. that men never would. How do you, yeah. how do you deal with that challenge? I mean, does it really frustrate you? It is frustrating, yeah, because obviously in an ideal world, I would love to be a full time professional footballer. Um, that would be the dream job, but I can see that in the future. I really can see it in the future because it is heading that way. But I think my time's a little bit before that. So for me, it's frustrating because I could think in like 20 years time, I could be that pro footballer at the level that I am. Mm. Whereas right now that, that it won't happen and it can't happen. So it is frustrating. But I guess it's, it's you know, what's extraordinary is how many women like you just get on with it. Oh yeah, no, we got on with it. I think a lot of women just do the sport just for the love of it, just for the fun of it because they love it. When I get asked questions between, you know, male football and women's football, it, mm. it's it's a different game. And, and I find that women's football is a lot more passionate than the men's side because you literally are doing it for the love of it, not to go and pick your pay, pack it up at the end of the game or anything yeah. like that. So don't get me wrong, men's football, you know, there is passion in there, but I just do find women's football is a lot more on the passion side because girls do finish work at five o'clock at night and then go to training, come home, do the same again the next night. So... They literally have to do it for the love of it. Tell me about what the summer has meant to you with the success of the Lionesses. Oh, it's been brilliant. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, I love it when it comes to a Women's World Cup because I I know we're going to do well, but I just, it it, it only gets frustrating when it gets to the knockout stages because I know how well that they can do. It's just obviously getting to the final, but it's been really good to see other people watching it that I haven't seen watch it before, like my dad, for example. He's obviously always watched me and loved loved seeing me play football, but I've never seen him put an England game on. He did message me when England were on, saying I've got the game on, without me having to prompt him. And to me, that's a big thing. So if my dad's doing that, you know, plenty of other people will be doing it as well. So yeah. that's really good to see. And it shows how much the women's game has grown. There does seem to have been a shift in attitude, doesn't it? And I don't think it is just down to the success of the Lionesses and how well, you know, they did do. But... Do you feel there is that shift in attitude? You mentioned your dad, but I mean, I've known women who I've worked with previously who've played football, and when they mention it, there, there's a certain amount of eye rolling that goes on that imagines you just sort of tripping around your pitch in stilettos and not really knowing what you're doing. <laughs> Have you noticed people having a bit more respect for your for your your, your craft, essentially? Yeah, I think I think people have actually realised that women can actually play football. <laughs> um, 
I think for many years, because he's not been in the media, it's not been publicised, I think people have just kind of guessed what women's football's like. Yeah. Whereas now you can see it on the tally and you can you can go down and easily watch, uh, watch a game for, for not really much money at all. I think people have now seen that it is a good level and it is enjoyable to watch. Our home crowds have increased loads over the past couple of years for people just coming down, mm. watching, thinking, oh, I'll come down to watch one game and then they can't get enough of it. How do you cope? We've talked about cha- changing attitudes, but how do you cope with with that ne- negativity? I mean, a, amongst the very small, it has to be said, it, and getting smaller, but very vocal group of men who completely denigrate female sport of any kind, essentially. How do you deal with that? I don't bite very often. <laughs> I don't bite as much as I used to. I just have to ignore it because, to me, they've got a lack of understanding. Mm. They don't understand women's football. They don't understand the game. They don't understand the women that play football. So... I wouldn't want to give them the limelight that they're wanting for something that they don't understand. So something it gets difficult when you see some comments thrown around, but I've had that for God knows how long. I've had it for years. So it's just at a point now where it has to take something very big to push me to say something other than that. I just I just completely ignore it. What does being captain mean to you? Um, I think at the time it was a bit like I was a bit in awe of it because I was so young when I was 18. I was like, what me? Well, what have I done to deserve that? <laughs> But year after year, it is something that I am really proud of that I never actually expected to have, with it being like my local club and my family support the team and that. So the only time I usually notice it is when I can see like my dad proud or my mum proud, and that makes me feel proud in a way. Um, But it is a responsibility that I love having. Like I'd never not want to have it now, um, which is up to my own doing. But um, no, I love it. I absolutely love it. And I love the responsibility and I love everything that comes with it. What sort of leader are you? Uh, as a difficult one, it depends. Depends what mood I'm. <laughs> I'd say, like, I am organised. I like to be able. I like people to to be able to to come and speak to me. I like to be approachable, but I also, I also go with. It's hard to do. It's hard to explain. I don't mind people doing anything wrong. People making mistakes, as long as those mistakes are learned from. If that yeah. makes sense. Yeah. Um. So I'd rather tell somebody or them ask me a question, me help, and then that doesn't happen again. So I'm not I'm not the type to ball, scream and shout. I'm not that kind of person at all. I am vocal when I'm a bit aggy. <laughs> but I am I'm organised, I'm approachable and um I like to say I'm consistent. And who are your role models, Meg, either in either in your career or in your sport? My granddad's a big, big role model for me and my dad, because my dad used to play football when he was when he was younger. So if I've got any questions that I need to ask or if I'm unsure or anything, the first person I'll probably go to is my dad. It's funny how many women I speak to on the Northern Power Women podcast when I ask about their role models, say their dad. And it, it's so interesting because we talk about how important it is to have female role models, but that crucial role model actually can come down, as I said, to your dad, which again shows how important it is for men to be part of any conversation about equality. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Well, my, my dad taught me when I was a kid. He, he, he was a coach when I was a kid. We tend to have the same understanding. Um, so I understand him, he understands me. And like I say, if I've got any questions, I know I can go to him and he can give me the answer that I need because he's very honest. Like when I was a kid, when he used to play football, if I had a bad game, he, he would tell me. <laughs> He'd be honest yeah. and tell me. So I know that I'm going to get the truth from him, whatever I ask him. So anything like that, he is he is the first person to go to. Like I have got role models in the women's game, yeah, but somebody a lot closer to me is the person that I would look up to and the person that I would ask the questions of. Finally, Meg, you're running at life full pelt. (laughs) Basically, you've got a job (laughs) which is very full on, but you thrive from that. Your hobby, your passion is also very, very full on. How important in a world where we can get so caught up with just our work and think there isn't time for anything else that, that nurtures us in any other way, how important is it for people to find that passion outside of work, especially if they're thinking, I don't have time for anything else? I, I think it's massively important. It gives you the release. It allows you to to get rid of your stress. Uh, like if I didn't play football, there would be something else that I would be doing because I couldn't come home from work, send watch the telly, come home from work, send watch the telly. Like you have to have something that, that you care about, something that you're passionate about. And that that for me is is it's massive for me. So I think some people who do have the stressful jobs and the stressful lives, I think that is something that they could, you know, take up and it could help them um, within their work. Because I go to work after I finish training the day after and I feel a lot less stressed. 
because I've been able to relieve it. Whereas some people who have these very high up jobs or very stressful jobs are just getting stressed day after day after day after day with no release. So if people can find a hobby or they can find something they're passionate about, that is something that I really would recommend. Brilliant insight from Meg there about how a passion outside of your work can actually really help you with stress relief inside your work. Thank you again to Meg Boyer from Searchability. Now, whose life and career would you like to know more about? Do get in touch. Let us know. Someone on the Northern Power Women Future List, the Power List, someone within your organisation. Do get in touch. Let us know. Email podcast at northernpowerwomen.com. So now it's time for Ask the Hive. It's the part of the podcast where you can get some brilliant advice from the Northern Power Women Hive Mind. Now, if you've got a question or a concern about your career or working life, or in fact anything, do get in touch. This month, a problem about never hearing back. I'm trying to get a new job at a fairly junior level and nine times out of ten don't even get a confirmation they have received my application. What can I do to stand out from the crowd? To answer this, I think I would make, try and make a personal connection with the recruiter. I'd either follow it up with a phone call to say, I'm just checking you got my CV. Um, and then if you weren't successful for shortlisting, I'd maybe just give a ring and say, you know, was there any feedback you could give me about my CV? I know lots of people don't have time to do that, but it's always worth making that personal connection. If you're trying to get a new job at a junior level, my advice would be to find out as much as you possibly can about the most senior person in the company. Go and look at their LinkedIn, see if they've got a company Facebook page, see if you can find out their hobbies, their interests, what they're like as a person, and then write your application as if you were writing to them. Because that way, everybody in the company who knows anything about their boss will know that their boss will like you, and that way they will be made to look good by employing you because they are recruiting somebody that can speak the same language and likes the same things as the person that pays them. So as somebody who's been sort of getting into similar junior roles recently, I think the most important thing is just to be assertive and to make sure that you're working on your assertiveness at all times. You know, half of communication is always being clear about what you need. So get in contact with them and say, hey, I've noticed that you haven't got back to me. Just wanted to check that you received anything. Is there anything more I can do? Um, I think just making sure you've got a really good cover letter, getting across the key points about yourself, what you're interested in, how you can support the business you're applying for effectively um, and getting your enthusiasm across as well from the very beginning. As HR manager, I um, make a conscious effort to ensure that all of our applicants actually do get a response, um, regardless at the point of them submitting an application. I know a lot of companies don't do it, but I would never feel cheeky in phoning up and just checking that my application has been received. Often that first impression on the phone is a, is a good way to stand out from the crowd. I really don't see the harm in doing that and I'd always encourage people to phone up and speak to the companies directly. With regards to making your application stand out, I think just making it very clear and working towards the job description and just showing how you meet that criteria that they're looking for. Don't just put everything that you've ever done, just really tailor it to the job. As somebody who has um, worked her way up in media, I can say that it's really helped to try and uh, get in touch with those who would be your line manager or those who are related to your job and try and contact them over Facebook or over LinkedIn and try and make that connection to help you stand out from what is a really competitive time to look for jobs at entry level. I think the best way to get started with job applications would be to make some connections in the industry that you're in. Then when you do apply, people might recognise your name um, from your CV and from making friends on social media. So from experience, uh, I always try and bombard people with feedback and try and get in touch with them personally as well. I think volunteering in the community and looking at their events and activities in which they put on, everything that you can possibly try and do to try and work within that field, um, whether that's contributing your time, active on social media such as LinkedIn and Twitter, definitely helps. It's tricky because if you don't hear back, it is quite disheartening. I think it's standing out. It's just think about that someone is actually going to read your CV. It was, it's all black and white and it's all quite boring. Would you want to read it? Maybe, maybe not. Jazz it up a bit. Quite simple, but just make it stand out. Keep it really short. And um, it's, it's, it's worked for me so far. So, uh, yeah, hope that, hope that works. 
I think the best way to stand out is to show pure passion in what you're doing. If this is something you really want to get into, for instance, just go the extra mile. Put more details on your CV. Show you've done some outside learning. I know it can be really hard for graduates because they won't necessarily have that experience, so it's a catch-22. But I definitely say follow up, get, show that you're passionate and just keep pushing through and that one application will come through. So as a recruiter I know that we do get a lot of applications and we don't necessarily have the time to get back to everyone so I would always say do not be afraid to follow up. So many people won't just call and chase their application out of fear of being rude or fear of kind of seeming too keen so just always follow up with a phone call or an email whatever you're most comfortable with and I would always say add a cover letter as well at the first application point because that will help you stand out. Thank you so much if you took the time to offer your advice this month. Really, really appreciated. Now, next month, we're going to hear more of your brilliant Northern Power Women shout outs as you celebrate women and men in your sector who you think deserve a little bit of extra recognition. It's really great to let them know how appreciated they are. So that's coming up for you next month. You can, of course, send us your shout out. Podcast at northernpowerwomen.com is where you can email that. Or, of course, connect with us at any of the live events we put on throughout the whole month just check the website northernpowerwomen.com for details of the next event. But the next Ask the High for your consideration is about sweet treats at work. This sounds ridiculous, but everyone brings in cakes and biscuits into work all the time and I hate it. Every day there's something and I feel like a killjoy not eating it as everyone oohs and ahs, then they have a go at me for not bringing anything. It's making me really uncomfortable. We're only a small team. Help! Does a constant presence of cake drive you mad in the office? Do you feel pressurised to get baking? Any advice you have, please do get in touch. All you need to do is record a voice memo on your phone and mail it to podcast at northernpowerwomen.com or, of course, come to our Lex Live panel recording as well. You can tell us there. As I said, all the details online at North Power Women on Twitter or on Instagram at Northern Power Women. Well, there we go for yet another month of great stories, great advice and great ideas. A really big thank you for listening this month and please do spread the word. We'd love more people to join in the conversation. So tell everyone you know, please, about the Northern Power Women podcast and a review or a rating wherever you listen to your podcasts will mean that more people are able to find us. So a big thank you to you. A massive thank you as well to our fabulous sponsors this month, multi-award winning recruitment agency, Searchability. If you're considering a career in recruitment, Searchability are interested in hearing from new talent across the North. So just visit searchability.co.uk and you can join their award winning team. Save the date then. The next episode is coming to you on Tuesday, September the 3rd. Until then, this is the Northern Power Women podcast. I'm Sam Walker, and this has been a What Goes On Media production for Northern Power Women.